All right, Genesis 26, verse 1. Now there was a famine in the land, besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, a king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She's my sister. For he feared to say my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah because she was attractive in appearance. When he'd been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she's your wife. How then could you say she's my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. And Isaac sowed in that land, and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him, and the man became rich, and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants, so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled the earth all with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Esek, because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarrelled over that also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham your father. Fear not, for I am with you, and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. When Abimelech, Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahazath his advisor and Philcol the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me? seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you. They said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you should do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. In the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths, and Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. That same day Isaac's servants came and told him about the well that had been dug, and said to him, We found water. He called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. 
So far in this series, we've looked at how Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac and how God provided a substitute for Isaac. We saw how Isaac foreshadowed the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. In the second sermon, we looked at Isaac's marriage to Rebekah and how that marriage reflects our relationship with God. Last week, we looked at Isaac's family and how Isaac and Rebekah turned to God in the challenges of life, particularly uh, through Rebekah's barrenness and then through her pregnancy and uh, the life of her children. We've, we've seen in some of these images how Isaac went out into the fields to meditate and to reflect on his relationship with God and how he turned to God in times of trouble or hardship. But what was Isaac's relationship with God like? Well, this morning we're going to look at Isaac's faith. We're going to look at how God tested his faith, how Isaac displayed a lack of faith, how Isaac lived out his faith, and finally, how Isaac's faith was affirmed. And through it all, we're going to see God's faithfulness to Isaac. So let's start with how God tests Isaac's faith. Verse 1 and 2. It says, Now there was a famine in the land, beside the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. I don't think we really understand famines in our day. Even if farmers here in Australia have a poor season, we just ship food from overseas or interstate. Uh, the prices might vary a little bit, but there's always food on the shelves. But in the ancient world, famines were terrible. They were often caused by drought from lack of rain. Their crops would dry up and wither away. Their, their flocks and their herds would die from starvation and lack of water. Our text actually mentions the famine in the days of Abraham, when food was so scarce that he left the promised land and went to Egypt. And it seems Isaac might be tempted to do the same thing. Famine tempted Isaac to flee. But God appears to Isaac and tells him, don't go to Egypt, but stay in the promised land. Isaac actually lived most of his life in the wilderness in a place called Beer Lahoi Roy, or the well of the living one who sees. But when famine strikes, he moves towards the coast to a city called Gerar, which was controlled by the Philistines. It's possible that the name Abimelech, which means my father is the king, uh, could also be a title. Uh, so father king. So it's like the father who's the king of the nation. But God wants to know whether Isaac will trust him. God had promised to give Abraham and his descendants the land of Canaan. But now it seems that God can't even provide food and water for his people. Will Isaac stay in Canaan or will he flee to Egypt? But it's, so God tells uh, Isaac, stay here in uh, the land of Canaan. But God does even more than that. God actually makes a covenant with Isaac. Verse 3 to 5. He says, sojourn in this land and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And will give to you, to your offspring, all these lands. And to your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. So firstly, notice that God starts with a precept. He tells Isaac to sojourn in Gerar. So that's the command. That's the precept. Stay here in Gerar. Sojourning implies that Gerar would only be a temporary place of residence, not a permanent one. Basically, God is asking Isaac to stay and to wait. Verse 6. 
And that's what God asks of us as well, to just trust Him. Don't run away, just stay and see what God will do. So that's the precept. God next gives Isaac a promise. In fact, he gives numerous promises here. Firstly, he says, I will be with you. What an awesome promise that is. God has appeared to Isaac for the very first time in his life. And remember, he's likely around 100 years old. But finally, God appears to him and he says, I will be with you. In fact, God has always been with Isaac. Even when we can't see him, God is with us as well. Jesus makes that same promise to you and me. He says, I am always with you. No matter what's going on in your life, Jesus is with you. Secondly, God promises, I will bless you. God is present with Isaac in order to bless him, to enrich his life. And that's just not health and wealth, but that's relational blessings, emotional blessings and spiritual blessings. In fact, God makes the same promise to you and me as well. Paul writes, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Jesus says that even when we're persecuted for his sake, even when people hate us, we are blessed. Our greatest blessing aren't the things we have, but our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Thirdly, God promises to establish with Isaac the covenant he made with Abraham. He says to him, I will give you all of these lands. I will multiply your offspring. I will bless all the nations of the earth through you. Exactly the same promises that he gives to his father Abraham. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that God chose to make a covenant with Isaac at the moment when he's tempted to pack up and get out. It's as if God is saying to Isaac, don't give up on me. Keep trusting me and I will come through for you. Finally, God gives Isaac the premise for his promise. He says, because Abraham... He says, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. God is doing this because of Abraham's obedience. It's interesting that those four words, uh, my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws, appear here for the first time in the Bible. And, and this is the only time they appear in Genesis. In fact, at this point in history, there were no codified charges, commandments, statutes or laws yet. God had written nothing down. There was no lists of things to obey. But Moses, who most likely wrote these stories down, uses these four words for three reasons. Firstly, to show that Abraham completely obeyed God's will. It wasn't like Abraham had it easier because the law didn't exist yet. Rather, God's call over his life was just as all-encompassing as it is for all of God's people. It's not a different standard pre-law to post-law to post-Christ. Rather, the standard is what pleases God. The standard is what is right in God's eyes. The standard is God's will. That's the premise for the promise. If you want God to, to uh, work in your life, you have to obey all of his rules. And that's what Abraham did. Secondly, God is calling Isaac and you and me to complete obedience as well. He's holding up Abraham as an example for you and I to follow. Will you give your life to me like Abraham did? That's what God is asking Isaac and that's what God is asking you and me. Will we obey God's precepts, charges, commandments and statutes? But we know from the Bible that Abraham didn't perfectly obey God's law. And you and I don't perfectly obey God's will either. So what do we do with uh, challenges like this? 
Well, the answer is these challenges are designed to point us to Christ's perfect obedience. It's only Jesus who perfectly obeys God's will. It's only Jesus who keeps God's charge, his commandments, his statutes and his laws. God is ultimately calling Isaac and you and me to put our faith in Jesus, the one who is truly righteous and the one through whom, through when we put our faith in him, makes us righteous. We want to do God's will, not because we want to be declared righteous in God's eyes, but because we've already been declared righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. So God is testing Isaac's faith. Will he do what I have called him to do? And by the grace of God, Isaac obeys. Verse 6, so Isaac settled in Gerar. God told him to sojourn in this land, and that's exactly what Isaac does. Like God makes a covenant with Isaac, so God makes a covenant with you and me. God promises to be with us and to bless us and to give us a, an eternal home as long as we put our faith in Jesus and in his righteousness. And like God's covenant with Isaac was based on the obedience of someone else, so God's covenant with us is based on the obedience of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And like God calls Isaac to respond to his grace with faith, so God calls us to respond to his grace with obedience. When you are tempted to give up on God's promises, when you are tempted to run, remember what Jesus has done for you and keep trusting in God. But what happens when your faith wavers? What happens when you fail the test? Because that's what happens to Isaac. He might have passed the first test, he responds with obedience, but what happens next reveals Isaac's lack of faith. Verse 7. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She's my sister. For he feared to say my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah because she was attractive in appearance. If Isaac's first test of faith was famine that made him want to flee, the second test is fear that leads to falsehood. Isaac is afraid that these Philistines will kill him and take his wife. You see, often people lie because they're afraid. Kids lie because they're afraid that they'll get punished. They think if they tell the truth, I'm going to get in trouble, so I'm going to lie instead. Adults lie because they're afraid of what people might think. We put on a front because we're afraid that if people found out what we really like, they wouldn't like us or they would hate us or something. We lie to cover up our sin. Unfortunately for us, or I should say fortunately for us, Lies always get found out. And that's exactly what happens to Isaac. Verse 8. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. Uh, that word laughing is actually the same word that the name Isaac comes from. So Isaac was Isaacing with Rebekah. We don't know exactly what they're doing. Uh, but whatever it was, it was enough for Abimelech to put two and two together and realise that uh, uh, Re Rebecca wasn't Isaac's sister, she was his wife. So I don't think Abimelech is exceptionally insightful, rather I think God intervened. Abimelech's light bulb moment was actually God flicking on the switch because God doesn't want us to get away with sin. The evidence that God loves you is that he doesn't want you to, uh, he doesn't let you drive your life into the ditch. God intervenes in our lives. He grabs the wheel, he steers us away from the ditch and back onto the right path. And that's what God is doing in the life of 
Isaac right here. Because God doesn't just intervene, he actually confronts Isaac's sin. And what's most confronting is that God uses a pagan king to do it. Verse 10, Abimelech said, What is this that you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you have brought guilt upon us. I don't think there's anything more confronting than when God uses the world to confront sin in us. When I see non-Christians standing up for the environment, I find that confronting. Because God tells us to care for his world. And yet often it's other people outside the church that are doing the best things. When I see non-Christians loving their spouses, I find that confronting. Because the truth is divorce is almost as high in the church as it is in the world. We're just as unloving as the next person is. When I hear non-Christians defending the rights of children, that confronts me because often they're condemning the abuse of children in the church. When I see generosity of non-Christians, that's confronting because God calls us to be generous and yet we're as materialistic as the next person. When I see non-Christians supporting minority groups, that confronts me. Because often Christians are known for being judgmental and condemning. God wants to confront our sin and sometimes he'll use other people to do that. But we also see God's grace at work in Isaac's life. Verse 11. So Abimelech warned all the people saying, whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. The interesting thing is that the person who should be put to death is Isaac. How could he ever put his wife in that position? He's an absolute loser. And yet when he gets caught, he gets let off. In fact, he gets protected. God in his grace protects Isaac and restores his marriage. The good news is that when your faith wavers, when you fail the test, God doesn't give up on you. God lovingly intervenes, God confronts your failures, and God shows you his grace time and time again. I think confronting your sin, your mistakes and your failures is one of the hardest things you'll ever have to do in your life. It takes great uh, humility and vulnerability, but it's also one of the best things that God will ever do for you. He sets us free from our guilt. He, sets, he reminds us just how deep his love for us goes. He lifts us up and draws us closer to himself. When your faith is lacking, don't dig your heels in. Rather, humble yourself before God confess your sin and experience his grace. So Isaac passes his first test. He fails the second. But faith isn't just about tests. It's about how we live in relationship with God. So let's focus on what a life of faith looks like. And we're going to start with God's blessing. Verse 12 and 13. Uh, it says, and Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. Firstly, notice for the first time in the Bible, someone is sowing crops. I'm not suggesting that Isaac invented agriculture, but he knows in a famine he needs to provide other food sources for his family and his flocks. And so he starts sowing grain. And God blesses his efforts uh, with a hundredfold yield. In the midst of famine, uh, God seems to flourish Isaac. He doesn't just become rich, he becomes very wealthy. Uh, the Hebrew literally says he became great and he became even more great and he became exceedingly great. So basically God just blessed his socks off. But despite God's blessing, in fact, because of God's blessing, the world hates him. We see that hatred in three ways. Firstly, they envied him. 
Verse 14 says, The Philistines envied him. They saw everything that God was giving to Isaac and they wanted it for themselves. They didn't like that God was blessing Isaac. Secondly, they buried Abraham's wells. Verse 15. Now the Philistines had filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. To be honest, that's just vindictive. I mean, water is a precious commodity, especially in arid regions. And yet, instead of using those wells or letting other people use them, they buried them in earth. They didn't want Abraham and his family to come back. They wanted to make it as hard as possible. Thirdly, they banish Isaac. Verse 16, And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Before, Isaac was afraid of the Philistines, and now the Philistines are afraid of Isaac. And so they tell him to leave. And that's exactly what Isaac does. But Isaac's struggles are far from over. We're told that he leaves the city of Gerar and he heads up to the other end of the valley. But now that he's away from the city, he needs to secure water again for himself and his family and his flocks. And so he reopens the wells that his father Abraham had dug a hundred years earlier. But in verse 20 we're told, the herdsmen of Gerar quarrelled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Asek, because they contended with him. He calls it the well of contention. He just wants to settle down and get on with life, but it seems he's still too close. They don't want him there either. Verse 21 says, Then they dug another well, and they quarrelled over that also. So he called its name Sitna. He calls it the well of adversity or enmity or strife. It's literally the well of Satan. I don't think I'd like to drill, drink water from the well of Satan. It just doesn't sit right. And so Isaac keeps moving. Verse 22. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. He calls this one the well of room. And notice that he sees that this is God's doing. The Lord has made room for us. Isaac sees the fact that the locals have stopped making trouble for him, that he's finally on the right track. This is where God wants me to be. And he not only sees the Lord's hand at work, he trusts that God will continue to work, that God will make him fruitful again. You see, the life of faith isn't a simple stress-free road to endless blessing. Rather, it's a road that takes many unexpected twists and turns. It's a road marked by suffering and opposition. It's a road that requires us to keep trusting in God's promises, to keep clinging to him in faith, to keep going, believing that God is with us, that God is at work, and that ultimately God will come through for us. Sometimes we will experience seasons of immense blessing, and other times we will experience seasons of hardship and opposition. We will find ourselves digging wells of contention or drinking from the well of Satan. But when we make room for God in our lives, God creates room in our lives. Space for us to grow. Space for us to flourish. Space for us to experience God's blessings again. The life of faith is a life where we need to keep trusting God in the good times and in the bad. And in the end, we see Isaac's faith in God affirmed. Firstly, God reaffirms his covenant with Isaac. Verse 23 says that Isaac moves on from Rehoboth until he comes to Beersheba, uh, where possibly a previous Abimelech made a covenant with Abraham, which is why it's called the well of the oath. That's what Beersheba means. 
But as soon as he arrives there, God appears to him a second time and says, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. God reaffirms his promise to be with Isaac and to bless Isaac and to multiply his offspring for Abraham's sake. But he adds this time, fear not. We've already seen that Isaac wrestled with fear. He feared famine and it made him want to flee to Egypt. He feared the Philistines, which made him lie about his relationship with Rebekah. But God encourages him not to live in fear because God is on his side. Jesus makes the same promise to you and me. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. The remedy for fear is faith. The remedy for fear is trusting that God is with you in that moment. The remedy for fear is trusting that God will bless you in the end, that his promises will come true. The future might not be multiple offspring. Rather, our future is to be with God forever in heaven. We aren't afraid of what the future holds because God holds our future in his hands. Our hope, our confidence is in our covenant relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's where our confidence comes from. That's why we're not afraid of what this world will do to us. And what's different about Isaac's response to God's covenant is that this time he worships God. Last time he responded with obedience. He did what God said. Uh, this time he responds with worship. And I want to, uh, it says in verse 25, so he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. I just want to say a few things about his worship. Firstly, his worship is public. The thing about building an altar is that everyone can see it. You, you, you build this big monument that's public. It's out there. Everyone can walk past it. Everyone can see that. An altar stands as a public monument to God's faithfulness. It stands as a testimony to God's grace. When we worship God, we do so publicly. We don't sneak off on Sunday mornings. We make a public statement that God matters, that God deserves to be honoured. Secondly, notice that Isaac pitches his tent next to the altar. His worship is communal. This isn't just a personal and private affair. It's something that he does with his whole family, probably all of his servants as well. Worship is something we do as a family and as a community of believers. It's communal in nature. Thirdly, an altar is also a memorial. Every time Isaac walks past that altar, he's reminded of the promises that God has made to him. And in a sense, that's what worship is all about. It reminds us of who God is and what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Worship reminds us that God is worthy of our praises. Next, an altar reminds us of the need for sacrifice. It doesn't mention that Isaac sacrificed on the altar, but that's what you do on altars. You, you do a burnt offering on that altar. An altar reminds us that to approach our holy God, we need to first deal with our sin. Isaac's sacrifices pointed towards the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what we remember that when we gather to worship that our worship is only acceptable in God's eyes because of the sacrifice of Jesus, because Jesus has washed away our sin. Next, Isaac worships out of gratitude. He worships God because of the awesome promises that God has made him. He worships God because of the way God has protected him and blessed him. Our worship isn't about sucking up to God in the hope that God will bless us. 
Rather, it's an act of grateful thanksgiving for God's love and grace shown us in Jesus Christ. We worship God because we're grateful for what He has done. Finally, Isaac's worship is a sign of his commitment. He arrives at Beersheba and the first thing he does is worship God. In fact, he worships God before he secures a source of water. Isaac is saying what I need more than water is God. I need to honour him first in my life. Worship is something we need more than we need food or water. We need, it's something that we commit ourselves to first and foremost in our lives. We commit to being here every Sunday because that's what worship is about. Saying, God, you're first in my life. The first thing that I block out every week is going to worship with your people. So God affirms his covenant with Isaac and Isaac worships God. The final affirmation of Isaac's faith is the peace that God gives him. We don't know how long Isaac is in Beersheba, but at some point Abimelech seeks him out. In verse 27, Isaac asks, Why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? Isaac doesn't mince any words, does he? They have treated him unjustly and he wants them to know that. It's sort of a good reminder to us that it's okay not to be silent in the face of injustice. The Bible calls us to speak up for justice, to confront the sinful behaviour of other people. What it says we can't do is take revenge for those injustices. We're to leave vengeance to the Lord, but we can speak up. But the reason Abimelech comes to Isaac is because he wants to make a treaty with him. Verse 28, they said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. I think they're overstating their case a little bit. Sure, they never touched Isaac or his wife, but they didn't really send him away in peace. Rather, they banished him out of envy and fear. But God calls us to seek for peace. The Bible says, strive for peace with everyone. Paul says, let us pursue what makes for peace. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. And that's what Isaac does. He throws them a feast and they exchange oaths and in verse 31 it says, And they departed from him in peace. The story ends with Isaac back in the promised land and at peace with his neighbours. God tested Isaac's faith. Would Isaac do what he asked? Would he stay and wait and see what God would do in his life? And despite the famine and despite his fears and his falsehoods and his failures, Isaac doesn't flee. Despite the hardships and the hatred of the world, Isaac keeps trusting the Lord and the Lord comes through for him and Isaac finds peace. Isaac is an example of faith. This morning we've been reminded that God initiates a covenant a relationship with us, not based on what we do, not based on our faith, but based on what another has done, based on God's faithfulness to us in Jesus Christ. Sometimes God tests our faith to see whether we will keep trusting Him despite the challenges that we face. Sometimes we lack faith. Sometimes we give in to famine or to fear, but God never gives up on us. Sometimes the world turns against us and the life of faith weaves between blessing and struggle. But in the end, God will affirm our faith in him. In the end, God will give us peace. So like Isaac, I want to encourage you to worship God, to do so publicly, to do so together as a church family as we remember the sacrifice of our Saviour Jesus Christ 
and as we show our gratitude and our commitment to Him. As God's people, let's stand and let's worship Him as we sing, Blessed be your name. Let's stand and sing.